is the president of the Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association. Uh, he's the general manager of Kesben FM in Kumasi in the Ashanti region. And certainly he has a lot to uh, tell us this evening. Let me welcome Mr. Andrew Dansu and Inkra to the podium. A round of applause will do. Thank you, sir, for your time. Thank you, Greg. Okay, so, um, good evening, all. It's a little challenging for me when I have to mount the same podium with seasoned, learned um, historians in media, journalism, and for me to approach the podium with um, prepared document when they themselves are not coming with prepared documents. So I'm challenged to speak ex tempo, but I will not do that because if I venture into that area, I'll be shooting myself. <laughs> <laughs> so permit me to just share some thoughts again on the subject of the state of the media freedom in Ghana, a critical look at contemporary journalism, the public interest, and security of the state. One particular interest I found in this topic is the fact that we did not say the public interest versus, but then we looked at the two, um, public interest and the security of the state. Um, I wouldn't want to sound like a lecturer, but I believe it is important that we look at some few things when we have to discuss a subject like this. So I ask myself if I am coming to talk about the media, what is actually journalism? You know, it's important that we take a look again or refresh our mind, our memories, on what is journalism. And one of the most interesting quotations I found, or definitions I found, the explanation, is the fact that um, journalism is the only form of communication that gives room for the practitioner or the writer or the presenter to articulate the mind of the people such that the more you have a democratic state, the more you have news, the more the practice of journalism should thrive. I think that is a problem we have. Because as we talk about democracy, as we talk about liberties, as we talk about freedoms, we are not able to remind ourselves that within that framework of freedom comes responsibility. And as much as we would want to shout about our freedoms, our rights, we have responsibilities. So that led me to look at the duties of a responsible professional journalist. And I'm not just saying a journalist, but I'm saying somebody who profess to be a journalist and who is responsible for the practice of journalism. Again, reading through all the documents that I found, one thing that stands out very cardinal is the fact that a journalist is responsible to tell the truth at all costs. That is a primary responsibility of a journalist to let or to seek the truth first, go after what is true in all situation and invent, both for public interest and for the state. 
and you also, or let's say the journalist also, to know that it is a right of the people to know the truth and to be told what is the truth. Then again, the second responsibility of the journalist being to protect the independence of the press. What does that mean? I kept on asking myself. You have the right or the responsibility to protect the independence of the press. What it means to a very large extent is that it gives you or it puts the responsibility on you to keep the dignity and sanctity of your profession such that in a can as we say obi mfa nsabinkum en chirende jefi to wait nobody points to his father's house or the direction to his father's house with the left hand when we believe we have the right to practice journalism and to practice it well and in safety we have the responsibility to make sure that people do not speak evil of what we do then your third responsibility is to remember that the people have the right to know. Producing what they must know is your responsibility. Producing what people must know is your responsibility. It is the responsibility of government first and foremost to let the people know. But when government do not find itself adequately doing this. The journalists have the responsibility to step in and to bring this about. So then I looked at when we are doing this, the issue of national security. I would want to, at this time, look at one interesting quote from Ambassador Satish Chandra, a former Deputy National Security Advisor to the State of India, who is now the Dean of the Center for National Security and Strategic Studies in New Delhi of the International um, Foundation in New Delhi. Now, he said this that the concept, and I'm quoting him, that the concept of national security has often been taken to merely connote the preservation of sovereignty, territorial integrity, and internal stability with a cohesive power of state. But he believes that in the face of the changing trends of issues pertaining to security and the interdependence of factors that confront our modern societies and cultures, it is imperative on all to begin looking at redefining what national security connotes in modern times, taking into consideration some factors such as international trade, cross-border crimes, international terror, cyber crimes, economic hardships, and even climate change. We need to look at all of this holistically because this is now what we call security. These are matters that borders on security. And we'd have to look at these things as they affect the people, that makes the people behave the way they behave. He further suggests that it will be important to shift away from the traditional concept and practice of concentrating the elements of cohesive state power on controlling factors and elements that are perceived to be at variance with internal government views to focusing on a more holistic approach at aggregating the resources 
the nation has, including the influence of the media, to tackle the challenges of achieving and guarding national coercion. In short, what he is trying to say is that we can come together with all the powers that we have to move media and national security towards a point where we can get everybody in the country moving towards a particular direction, such that whatever dreams we have within our country, it takes the security agencies and our media coming together and tackling the subject together as one. Well, so I looked at, again, um, some of the challenges. And straight away, I confronted the situation Madam spoke about recently, the implication of the emerging technologies on press freedom and national security. And one of the interesting things I found is that virtually almost everything we've had in the past the means of delivering information that we've had in the past have their modern forms. So today, for instance, when you look at um, the analog television, the way we produce information or news for the analog television, we have the digital television today. And the way we produce the analog television for the analog television transmission is different from the way we do digital. Then in Madame's time, when you have to write and have to get somebody to type and you have to probably put in, in those days I met the carbon paper. I don't know how many of you know the carbon paper. You know, when you have to use the typewriter and then you have to push it that way. And then you have to use the carbon paper and correct at the back. I'm not sure today we use the correction fluid anymore. But today, we have the internet as a means. And then blogging is one of the means that had come. Unfortunately, what we find happening with the emergence of technology is that a lot of governments are taking advantage of the emergence of technologies to hedge in the media as they introduce new technologies. Our country is not left out. So in our quest to move from the analog to digital transmission, DTT transmission, we've had to struggle with whether we should introduce the control, uh, conditional access into our technology. And then we are still talking about whether the national head and the management body of the national head and should be appointed by the president or not. The discussion is still ongoing. In May 2010, the US government under President Barack Obama attempted to widen the surveillance of the press and suppress leaks to the press by government agents by signing into law the infamous Daniel Peel Freedom of the Press Act. Now, this move caused widespread condemnation some few years later. And a lot of luminaries and um, free press advocates rose up against this. What should be the way forward? And these are my thoughts. Number one, I believe we can enter into dialogue. We can continue the dialogue. Today in Ghana, and as Madam rightly put it, the argument for some kind of government control of the press is rising, is coming. Whilst others believe the government has no business controlling the press. Whether government will control the press or will not control the press, some of us believe that continuing dialogue is the way forward. 
And the aim of the dialogue is to fashion out a mutually acceptable compromise. Another thing that we can also do is education. Currently in Ghana, we have a situation where some media practitioners believe that anything they come across should be published. And we believe that our freedoms can go to every extent. Recently, where the National Media Commission had to call some people to order for showing X-rated movies on their television channels, something which had not been heard of in this country. But one group of people believed that they could try it and they could push the borders. So we wake up and we hear news about national security raiding an internet communication office. And we are told they have published something that has to do with national security, which infringes on national security. We believe that a way forward is to continue education so that we would come to accept the fact that it is not everything that we can put out there. And as Ms. Ayabafo rightly put it, if the police is going to carry out an operation in an area, the journalists will call it a scoop. And so we think that by putting it out there or going live on radio to announce, as we do it in our area, run commentary on it, and why can you there is no point running commentary even on it. But I believe if we are not careful very soon, we'll get to that. Because the scoop and the first person to talk about it becomes the issue. I believe when we continue educating journalists and what they can do and what they cannot do, we'll bring us some kind of security in the interest of public safety. Again, it should not sound like I am in favor of putting restrictions on journalists or the work of the press. But I believe in the face of growing citizen journalism, there may be the need to draw new parameters on what can be freely published by who and how and to what extent. We may have to look at it again. What people go out there for and put out on social media. This may sound like censorship, but I believe strongly that a properly navigated path will yield the same outcome as denying a certain category of firearms to individuals, even though those individuals may have the right to possess guns for self-protection. Procedures may have to be introduced, and procedures may have to be cleared and followed for certain information to be relayed to the public. In conclusion, I believe the discussion and the debate on the work of the journalist in modern times with all the laws and technologies to support him or her work vis-a-vis -vis the state security apparatus believing in the activities of the media must continue. The discussion must go on. The debate must go on. But in the interest at the end of the day national development. Thank you for your attention. Thank you to another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much for...